Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Apocrypha Apocalypse. I'm Gary Machuda. We're going to talk about the early church fathers and the Old Testament canon. You know, on the web, in books, pretty much everywhere, whenever you see a Protestant appeal it's for the more restricted Old Testament canon, they get, invariably give a list of early church fathers, usually five or six of them. And first on that list is Melito of Sardis, who was the Bishop of Sardis, who wrote around 180 AD. And it's thought that Melito has given us the list of Old Testament books that were accepted by Christians in his day, and they omit the Deuterocanon, or what Protestants call the Apocrypha. Did Melito do this? Is he giving us a Christian list of the objective canon? Well, that's what we're going to look at right now on the Apocrypha Apocalypse. One of the beautiful things about doing the Apocrypha Apocalypse is I get to take time and look in depth at things that are often just brushed aside or thrown out there as evidence and really get a chance to look critically at it and make good assessments. And I think this is especially needed with Melito Sardis. As I mentioned in the introduction, Melito's invariably listed as probably the first of the early church fathers that are appealed to to prove that Christians accepted only the proto-canonical books. And in fact, here's a couple of claims. I think these are very typical claims made about Melito Sardis on various uh, websites and blogs and so on. For example, one says, quote, the earliest Christian list is Melito, and he gives an Old Testament list. So clearly they believe that Melito is giving the objective canon, that is the canon, which is all the books and only the books inspired by God as sacred scripture. And this claim is made often. Yeah, for example, another website says, quote, the most ancient list of the Old Testament books is that which is made by Melito Sardis circa AD 170. None of the apocryphal books were included. What they're implying is that what Melito was trying to do was to give the actual, true, and authentic Old Testament list Another claim, too, that's often rolled into it is that Melito is giving his own list. In other words, he's providing us with uh, as evidence of what Christians held to as sacred scripture. And you can see this uh, implied in statements like, in short, Melito held the same Hebrew canon as we have today, minus the book of Esther. Notice it says Melito held, so it is saying that Melito personally held these books and only these books as sacred scripture. Another passage says, early biblical scholars, Melito, Origen, Epiphanius, and Jerome rejected them. And again, this implies that since Melito is giving the totality of the Old Testament, the objective canon, in other words, that the omission of the deuterocanonical books constitutes a rejection of those same books. Is that really what's going on? Well, let's take a look at what Melito actually says, and it's found only in a fragment from Eusebius. And again, like I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of information from Melito. We only have his homily on the Passover and a bunch of fragments, and this comes by way of a fragment. So let's read it. It's in Eusebius' Church History, Book 4, Chapter 26. And we're going to read 12, 13, and 14. Okay, so Eusebius writes, quote, But in the extracts made by him, the same writer gives at the beginning of the introduction a catalog of the acknowledged books of the Old Testament, which it is necessary to quote at this point. He writes as follows. So this is Eusebius, and he's simply describing it comes from the book called Extracts. And it comes at the very beginning of the introduction. Now he quotes from Melito. Melito says, quote, Melito to his brother Onesimus, greetings. Since thou hast often, in thy zeal for the word, expressed the wish to have extracts made from the law and the prophets concerning the Savior 
and concerning our entire faith, and has also desired to have an accurate statement of the ancient book in regards to their number and order, I have endeavored to perform the task, knowing thy zeal for the faith, and thy desire to gain information regarding the word, and knowing that thou, in thy yearning after God, esteemest above all else, struggling to attain eternal salvation. Accordingly, I went to East and came to a place where these things were preached and done, and I learned accurately the books of the Old Testament and sent them to thee as written below. Their names are as follows. Of Moses, five books, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Jesus' Nave, Judges, Ruth, of Kings, four books, of Chronicles, two, the Psalms of David, the Proverbs of Solomon, Wisdom also, Ecclesiastes, Song of Song, Job, of Prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, of the Twelve Prophets, one book, Daniel, Ezekiel, Esdras, from which I also made extracts, dividing them into six books, unquote. Such are the words of Melito, unquote. So is Melito giving us the objective canon that should be accepted by all? Is he giving us his own canon or the canon that Christians accept that just so happen to be accepted by Jews? Or is there something else going on here? Well, let's look again at this passage. And if Melito is doing that, if he's giving the objective canon, and he's given the very canon that he and all Christians are to accept, some things kind of pop out. First, extracts. What is extracts, this book? What's the purpose of the book? And also, why did Melito place a catalog of the Old Testament books at the very beginning of the introduction of this work called Extracts? Why put a catalog at the very beginning of a work when it probably should belong more aptly to something later on or at the end? There's some other things, too. For example, why didn't Onesimus, who's a Christian, know which books were Scripture? I mean, they're being read in the liturgy as Scripture. How come he doesn't know which books belong to the Bible? But even more problematic is Melito. Now, remember, Melito is the Bishop of Sardis. He's over churches in Sardis. Does the Bishop of Sardis, doesn't he know which books are being read as sacred scripture in his own churches? How could a bishop be ignorant of something like that? That just strains credulity. Moreover, why did Melito have to travel all the way to the Holy Land in order to find out which books were being read as scripture amongst Christians? That's also problematic. Why didn't he just consult Christian communities in the area and ask, well, which books are being read as sacred scripture in your liturgy? And the reason I say that is because the Christian liturgy is more or less modeled after the liturgy of the synagogue, and there had always been a place or a station where the divine books are read. And so, you know, all you have to do is just consult which books are being read as divine scripture. Why travel all the way to Palestine? Why not consult any of the Christian communities between Sardis and Palestine? That's very strange. Another problem, too, is the list that he actually does receive doesn't correspond to the Protestant Bible or the modern rabbinic Bible. It's missing the books of Esther, Nehemiah, and it may include wisdom as well. Although I'm going to table the discussion on wisdom. Uh, some people say that wisdom here is being used as an alternative name for Proverbs. Others claim, and Protestants, by the way, claim that he's referencing the wisdom of Solomon. And I'll also stipulate Nehemiah as well. The reason for that is Nehemiah most likely was combined with Ezra. And therefore, when Melito spoke of Esdras, he was probably referring both to Ezra and Nehemiah, at least those two. So, okay, those are off the table. But what about Esther? Esther seems to be conspicuous. And like I said, it's, it's, this is recognized by everybody. It's, it's not controversial. But how does he get it wrong? Well, Let's think about this. Let's work through what we have here by Eusebius 
and see if we can come up with some answers to all those tensions and difficulties. Let's begin with what exactly is the book called Extracts. Melito himself tells us what these are. He says that uh, Onesimus wished to have extracts made from the law and the prophets concerning the Savior and concerning our entire faith. So he wants to have basically proof text, a book of collection of proof texts from the law and the prophets that speak to Jesus as Savior, that speak to the Christian faith. In other words, this appears to be a Christian apologetic work that could be used for the evangelization of the Jews. Now, this isn't just my opinion. If you consult Philip Schaff's translation of the post-Nicene Fathers that includes Eusebius, you'll notice there's a footnote by Extracts in which he quotes from another Protestant scholar. And McGifford says this, quote, The nature of the work is clear from the words of Melito himself. It was a collection of testimonies to Christ and to Christianity drawn from the Old Testament law and prophets. It must therefore have resembled closely such works as Cyprian's Testimonia and the Testimony of Pseudo-Gregory and other Jewish works, in which an appeal was made to the Old Testament, the common ground accepted by both parties, for proof of the truth of Christianity. Although the Eclogiae of Melito were not anti-Jewish in their design, their character leads us to classify them with the general class of anti-Jewish works, whose distinguishing mark is the use of the Old Testament prophecy in defense of Christianity, unquote. The extracts appear to be this apologetic work used by Christians to evangelize the Jews, or at least defend the Christian faith from the objections of the Jews. And this seems to be followed by modern Protestant scholars as well, that that's exactly what extracts is all about. So if it is a Christian work for apologetics against the Jews or in defense from the charges of the Jews, we find that all those idiosyncrasies, all those questions that we had earlier on are quickly resolved. Well, first off, it explains why Melito only lists Old Testament books. He never speaks about the New Testament, which is kind of odd, especially if it's a Christian work written for a Christian to instruct other Christians, right? You would naturally speak of which books belong in the New Testament, maybe even most especially. But that's omitted by, quote, in Eusebius. So since if this is a Christian apologetic work against the Jews, that makes perfect sense. Why? Well, because like McGirt points out, when you're doing apologetics, you need to appeal to a common authority, a common source. And so it's extremely important that you know what the common source is for you to give proof text. And that comports perfectly with what Melito says at the very end of Eusebius's quotation. He says that, quote, from which also I have made the extracts, dividing them into six books. So it's from these books that he lists that he's making his proof text. Again, that resolves that issue. It also explains why the list of Old Testament books is at the very beginning of the introduction, as Eusebius noted. Obviously, you want to find out what are the common authorities. So then when you get to the proof text, you know which books are being used and which ones are not being used. It also explains why Onesimus and Melito may not have known which books were authoritatively accepted as sacred books by the Jews. They obviously knew which books they accepted. They knew which books were being read in their churches as sacred scripture, but they may not have known what the Jews accepted as sacred books. But this opens up another difficulty. Why didn't Melito just knock on the door of the local synagogue to find out what the Jews accepted? We know through archaeology that there was a fairly large Jewish community in Sardis during the time of Melito, and he could have done just that, walked across the street, inquired at the local synagogue. Why didn't he do that? Well, it seems ridiculous that he didn't do it. 
Or why didn't he consult with some neighboring Jewish communities to find out which books they accept? One may object and say, well, the reason he didn't do that was because Jewish Christian dialogue was almost non-existent. We weren't talking to one another. It was, uh, there was a lot of conflict and hatred, and therefore he couldn't have done that. See, I personally don't give a lot of weight to that explanation for a number of reasons. First, yeah, I think if you go to a synagogue and you start claiming that Jesus is the Messiah, there's going to be problems, right? <laughs> Dialogue's going to be very short unless you're invited there or something like that. But which books are held sacred? I think that's pretty innocuous. In fact, I can't imagine why a rabbi would want to keep that hidden or secret from Christians. I mean, if anything, I would think they would want the Christians to know what the authentic texts are. But leaving that aside, we also have historical evidence that although, yes, dialogues were contentious, uh, nevertheless, they continued. Now, remember, if Melito's writing around AD 170, 180, only a couple of decades earlier, in 150, we have just a martyr dialoguing with Trifo the Jew and his companions. And uh, like I said, it's contentious, but nevertheless, it shows that Christian Jewish dialogues were engaged. And I think that also makes that objection not very probable. So why didn't the synagogue in Sardis, why couldn't they give Melito the accurate estimation of which books they accept as sacred? I believe that they weren't sure. And there's good reason for that if you understand where this work falls within the timeline of the development of the rabbinic Bible. Now, really quickly, let me just give you a recap of how I believe the rabbinic canon was closed in some Jewish history. And you can see in this context why there may be some confusion, especially in Sardis, as to which books were normative for Jews. I believe that the rabbinic canon was closed sometime around AD 100 to the beginning of the Second Jewish Revolt in AD 132. This was done under the auspices of Rabbi Kiba. And it was during this period that you have several indications that there is a formation of a normative canon within Judaism, which didn't exist prior to this point. For example, you have the repudiation of the Greek Septuagint, which is a Jewish translation of the Old Testament, which was the preferred Old Testament text for the New Testament. You also have several declarations and discussions happening in regards to which books are affirmed as sacred and books that were rejected or placed outside. You also have Rabbi Akiva begins to take the oral traditions of the Jews and put them into writing. So there's a selection of editing and so on. So there's a formation, a codification of Jewish belief, because after all, the temples destroyed in AD 70. And Judaism is essentially trying to redefine itself without the temple. It's also the same Akiba who identifies Simon Bar Kokhba as the Messiah is prophesied in the Book of Numbers. And so the Simon Bar Kokhba leads the Jews in this massive revolt against the pagan Romans, and it gets crushed around year AD 135. Bar Kokhba is killed, Akiba is martyred. And the Emperor Hadrian unleashes a persecution upon the Jews, a horrific persecution. Circumcisions forbidden, teaching the laws forbidden, several rabbis are martyred during this period. The assembly at Jemnia, rabbinic school, is forced to move to Usha and back to Jemnia, back and forth. You have a period of chaos where Judaism is really in a fight for its life uh, from 135 onward. It really isn't until about 200 AD that things calm down enough that the Jews can complete the work begun by Akiba under Rabbi Meir. And this ultimately culminates with the Mishnah, which is inscripturation of oral traditions of the Jews. So that's 200 AD. And then if you move a few decades after that point, then you have the composition of the earliest rabbinic list that we have 
and that's Baba Bathra, Baritha Baba Bathra. So you look at the timeline, you see that Melito Sardis fits within this period of chaos after the Second Jewish Revolt and before the codification of the Jewish traditions. I think that gives us reasons to believe that the Jews in the diaspora knew that some decision was made in the Holy Land, but perhaps they're not really clear exactly what that was. And hence, Melito ends up traveling to the Holy Land to basically get the word straight from the horse's mouth. It also explains the omission of the Book of Esther. The acceptance of the Book of Esther, as far as we can tell, Esther really isn't used very much in the early church writings, receives a very strong positive affirmation by Clement of Rome, who was writing very early on, probably some, at least before the end of the first century, maybe slightly after the end of the first century. And Christians afterwards accepted Esther as well. So it seems that the reception of Esther in Christianity is not super strong, but nevertheless, it's positive. The same thing cannot be said for the Jews. And in fact, we look at the Dead Sea Scroll community, we have yet to find any fragments of the canonical book of Esther. And by the way, no fragments of the canonical book of Nehemiah. Now, that Nehemiah is not a problem. Like I said, it's a short book. It's possible it's just simply lost the time. But nevertheless, it is interesting that Esther is omitted by the Dead Sea Scroll community. And also, if you look at rabbinic literature, uh, you see that the rabbis continue to debate whether or not Esther was sacred. And you see that these debates continue through the second Christian century, the third Christian century, even into the fourth Christian century. So doubts remain as to the canonical status of Esther within rabbinic Judaism. And what we'll show in other episodes too is when Christians try to assess which books the rabbis accepted, you'll see that Esther often ends up either being omitted or downgraded or something like that, or some expression is made as to doubts about Esther. And so the fact that Melito's list omits Esther, I think is a good indication that what he's producing is a rabbinic computation, not a Christian computation. I think if you look at all this evidence that we laid out, there is a very good case that could be made that Melito Sardis really isn't giving an objective Old Testament canon. He's certainly not giving the canon that he personally held but rather what he's trying to do is describe which books the Jews accepted for the purpose of apologetics. So the omission of any other books in his list doesn't tell you anything about what Christians accepted. It tells us what Jews accepted at this time. I think it also shows that there was a general confusion within rabbinic Judaism, I believe because of the second Bar Kokhba revolt, as to what exactly this legislation was Finally, I think, if anything, it implies that Christians and Jews at this point did not hold to identical collections of Old Testament books. Otherwise, Melito could have just simply repeated the books that he did accept. So in a sense, it implies that Christians, Jews do have different computations of their Old Testament. And that's very important because this is AD 170, 180. Unfortunately, Melito simply doesn't give us information as to which books the Christians accept. It's a very limited value. I think if it says anything about the Christian canon, it simply shows that whatever books were listed were those that Jews and Christians held in common. But that's really something that I think no one could test. Uh, the appeal to Melito as proof that the early church rejected the Deuterocanon is clearly false as is the claim that he is giving the objective Old Testament canon or that he's given his own canon or that he's expressing what Christians held at that time. None of that's true. I don't think it's supported at all by the context. So like I said, I love these podcasts. I love these videos because it allows us to take some time and work through things and hopefully give you some food for thought and really give you some thought as to whether Melito really should be appealed to as evidence for the Protestant canon. So everybody have a great day. God willing, we'll be back again soon. Bye-bye.